This is the House Healthcare Committee. It's Tuesday, May 4th, and we are here in our afternoon uh, session, uh, starting later than had been planned because House caucuses went ran long. And so we are, um, we are going to continue with our scheduled agenda this afternoon, but we'll come back. We're, we're skipping what we had scheduled at 115, which was a review of a particular budget section. But if we have time, we'll come back to that at the end of the afternoon. But right now we are returning again to the issue of children's mental health, children and mental health, and in particular, the uh, uh, pressures that are happening with children waiting for uh, far too long in emergency departments, waiting for inpatient services or other services as they're needed. And this morning we uh, spent between nine and 10 o'clock hearing from the commissioner of mental health, uh, along with some of her colleagues and colleagues from uh, Dale, from uh, DCF and from DIVA each briefly. Uh, but this afternoon we have uh, several other folks with us about the same issue. And first we have Devin Green with us from the uh, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. And uh, I must say that you're the, the part of what was referenced in the morning session, and Devin, I'm not sure if you had were able to tune into that session or not, because um, we haven't spoken between, uh, because other things happening for both of us. But uh, reference was made to the collection of data that the hospital systems have begun doing or uh, to give us, to give everyone involved a sense of the state, the number of children waiting in emergency departments and other related information. So I'll just, I wanna acknowledge that and say that there were some questions this morning as to whether the data that, that we heard from the Department of Mental Health corresponds with the data that the hospital association has. So I'm, I'm sure you will get to that, but I wanna mention that up front and invite you, and I see your colleague Emma Harrigan is with you, uh, to speak to that issue, but also to other related issues, because I know you've also provided a, a memorandum to our committee uh, previously. So with that, I'll turn it over to Devin, and then we will, uh, and we have Jack McCullough here as well from uh, the Mental Health Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid. We'll look forward to hearing from you, Jack, as well, and Sandy Endow, if she is able to join us. So first, I'll turn this over to Devin Green. Great, thank you, Chair Lipper. Uh, my name is Devin Green. I'm with the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. And Emma, I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself. Hi, for the record, Emma Harrigan, also with the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. And I'll go ahead and dive right into the data piece. I know there were some questions from this morning about the disparity of our data and um, DMH data and how we had 19 uh, children and adolescents waiting in emergency departments at one point while they had nine. And I would just say that our data is a point in time, so it's every Thursday at noon, we go to our emergency departments and we and all of our emergency departments and we say, who is in your emergency department for mental health treatment, children, adults, how long have they been waiting? Is it a day? Is it zero to five days? Is it above six days? And so um, we are collecting the data for everyone and we're doing this because there's been no great way to look at the emergency department data. Um, and that would encompass everyone. We've had this dialogue back and forth with DMH where they say, we are seeing so many people in the emergency departments and then our emergency departments are saying, well, we are seeing this other amount of people in our emergency departments. And I think a lot of that stems from the fact that um, DMH is, we are looking at everyone essentially who comes in. So whether it's commercial pay or voluntary or involuntary. Um, so that's the data that we're trying to capture here. Do you, do you have the most recent data that you have collected? So we don't have data for this week yet, but we will have a new collection point at Thursday at noon. But last week's data we saw, let me just 
pull it up real yeah, quick. Yeah, I was thinking last week's data would be the most recent collected data. That's correct. So last week we saw six children waiting in emergency departments um, for inpatient placement as of Thursday at noon. Okay, and I'm just gonna ask a few more questions about that. When you collect your data, and I, I've seen it, but I don't recall, do you uh, break it down by voluntary, involuntary, uh, or by payer type at all? No, we just do a point in time. So the only elements we collect are how many people um, by age group, so whether they're under the age of 18 or over, and then by the time that they were waiting, so less than 24 hours, uh, one day to six days or seven days or more. So we do not break it out by legal status or payer, but we are very clear with emergency department directors that we want every person waiting regardless of their legal status or their insurance type. Right. And of those who were waiting last Thursday, you say there were six based on your review of all the hospital emergency rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us any information as to how long they had been waiting? Sure. So for children, we had one child who was waiting less than one day, three children who had been waiting between one and six days, and two children who had been waiting seven or more days. Okay. And um, seven or more is pretty open-ended. So uh, I'm just wondering what that, if there's a... I'm just going to ask because I think we we really are trying to understand what we're what we're facing. Uh, because if seven or if two, did, I'm sorry, two were waiting more than seven or more days. Yes. So they would have been in the previous week's data. Yes. And can you remind us how many children were waiting based on your data the prior Thursday? I believe the time? prior Thursday was 19 children. And okay. our data brief, um, which I can send again so that it can be reflected in the record, um, we do collect anecdotal um, notes from emergency departments as they're willing to share. So some of that does give a little more detail. For example, one critical access hospital reported they had an adolescent who had been waiting four days before being discharged on Wednesday. Um, another critical access hospital reported an adolescent left after eight days waiting for an inpatient bed and ultimately was never admitted. Um, one acute care hospital reported that the adolescent who was currently waiting, so one of those two children, um, or I'm sorry, no, uh, one, of, one hospital reported that the adolescent currently waiting in their emergency department had also waited a total of 13 days over the course of two prior visits to the emergency department. Um, and then another hospital reported that um, they had no patients waiting as of the point in time count, but as of that Friday morning, they had another youth patient waiting who had arrived overnight. So sometimes we do get a little more detail, um, but we are trying to create a data collection process that can be collected quickly and efficiently to just give a sense of the numbers as quickly as possible for each week. Um, and I will say that Boz does eventually get the data on every visit that comes through an emergency department, it just runs about three months behind. And so those visits do give us more information on how many days each case waited, but we felt just being able to provide quick data um, and actionable data that that was the level of detail that emergency departments could provide quickly enough. Okay. And uh, you are at this point collecting this uh, each Thursday as a point in time can you remind us how, when that Thursday point in time measurement started? It started three weeks ago. Okay. Um, so we'll be able to, you will be able to, and we will be able to see that uh, tracked over time. Yes. Uh, not knowing if there's fluctuations up or down in the, in between the points in time, but at least at the points in time. Um, let me have one more question. Uh, if you are, so is, is there any process underway uh, for Voss and the Department of Mental Health to compare your data from your point in time data with what they are collecting to see if there is any, to see, there may not be a discrepancy. It could be that, you know, if you, if you collect, you collect on a Thursday and if they report something from a, say a Tuesday or a Monday, uh, their numbers will likely be different or could be different 
but it seems that it's important for us to not operate with a discrepancy with the, with numbers. And yeah, so I'm. So Oh, apologies. Um, yes, we are looking forward to working with the Department of Mental Health on making sure that our data are as comparable as possible. Um, and I think part of that will also be highlighting how our data collection processes are different. So while most of the volume coming in through emergency rooms for children does appear to be Medicaid visits, there are children who are private pay who DMH might not have information on. So I think highlighting the differences in um, in the total populations that each organization is able to collect information on will be important and also the process in which it's collected so our data comes directly from the emergency department directors or the emergency department nurse managers every thursday where dmh's process sounds like a combination of direct phone calls to designated hospitals and also designated agency emergency services directors which depending on the hospital may not be involved in every placement for admission, depending on whether the child is not affiliated with the designated agency or maybe is waiting on a voluntary status. So I think understanding those differences will be important and also, yes, looking for opportunities to align. Yes, and it's, it's it, it just to, to my mind goes without saying that it's, a, it's, a, it's imperative that the Department of Mental Health's data includes not just Medicaid, uh, Children, children who are who are eligible for Medicaid or or being uh, reimbursed through Medicaid, their care is being reimbursed through Medicaid, uh, but all children who may be waiting, whether they're private pay, uh, whether they're voluntary, involuntary, etc. So I think it's certainly my hope and my intention uh, on as the chair of this committee to continue for us to uh, pursue this uh, on an active basis. Uh, until we are all satisfied that we are collecting com comparable, uh, comparable data uh, that we, and, and that we watch not just the trend line, but that we watch the actual uh, data as best we can. And that we know, uh, as was not available today from the department, uh, that we know uh, not just the number of children waiting, uh, but in some ways an age range of the children waiting, but also the number of, the length of time the length and, and, and not just an average, but the, the, the range so that we're aware of where the outliers are and what, and, and when we say outliers, that really, what that means is a child and their family have been waiting, uh, a, you know, sometimes a, a, an extraordinary amount of time uh, in, a, in an emergency setting. Um, we 100% agree. And I think um, there are certainly opportunities through the process that we've established with DMH, but also I think a long-term goal of the electronic bed board and being able to collect this information so that we have a sense of the numbers, but also that it can be more actionable so that designated agencies or others who can help with finding placement for children have data in a as timely as possible and also at the level of detail they need to, to help move children out of emergency departments as quickly as possible. Yes. Um. Are you reporting your data to the Department of Mental Health on a weekly basis? Yes. So our Friday or Monday morning email goes out to um, hospital affinity groups, uh, the Department of Mental Health, and I believe uh, Ms. McGovern. Um, yes, I would ask it yep. on behalf of the House Health Care Committee. Yes. Great. Who, who then in turn should be forwarding it to all of us. Great. Uh, so we have a number of questions. I think we'll take some questions and then we'll, I think there may be other things you wish to comment on, but let's take some questions initially. And then in addition to my questions, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll hear further. Uh, Representative Goldman and then Representative Donahue, Representative Page. Thank you, um, Chair Lippert. I was just curious if I, under, I just want to clarify. So you started collecting data on April 13th. If you're saying it was three weeks back, is that correct? You have three weeks of data. Am I understanding that right? Yes, that's okay. correct. So on April 3rd, I mean, yeah, April 13th, can you tell us the data for that day? Um, Maybe not, I'm, I'm just looking, we did talk about trends, so. Um, but we could provide, uh, we have data briefs for each one of those weeks, so we could provide data briefs to, to the committee. That's great, thank you. And I also, are you collecting data on adults too? Yes, we are. So I would be interested in seeing both, um, if that's possible. 
um, that would be helpful. So yes. thank you. Great. Uh, Representative Donahue and Representative Peterson, did you have your hand up earlier? No, okay, Representative Peterson, I mean, Representative Donahue and then Representative Page. That was a perfect segue from Representative Goldman. Um, we required a few years ago and just extended the, the um, end date for getting emergency department uh, volume and, and wait times. Um, it, it, the report says individuals. Um, I know you're very familiar with them because you produce a lot of the data for DMH for them. Does that, in, does that include children and adults and they're not separated out or is that solely providing adult information? So the data that we provide to the Department of Mental Health for Act 200 is adults and children. Um, I will point out that the, the level of measurement is actually technically visits. Um, so there could be a difference between the number of visits that happen each year and the number of people that visit each year because people can have more than one visit. Um, but the point in time information, because it's it's a slice at a point in time is individuals. So we probably really ought to be requesting that that information be divided into adults and children if we want to follow those trends. I think we can definitely work with the department to make sure that we have the right level of detail in the Act 200 report. Can you remind me of the frequency of those reports? Those are annual reports that cover you know, a year by year, by year comparisons that we re receive. Um, Thank you. Representative Donahue, other questions right now? No, that was okay, good. Representative Page. Uh, yes, I'm kind of interested in the big picture. Um, regarding, regarding the collection of data for children with mental health issues, um, how, how did you start collecting it? Were you asked to collect it by the Department of Health or, or the Agency of Human Services? Or, or did you just, you know, based upon some of our committee uh, hearings, it, you decided to just simply do it on your own? So the, uh, the data that we provide year, o year over year um, in the Act 200 report was driven by the request of this committee or the request of the legislature. The, the data that we provide um, the Thursday point in time really was generated from a need coming from our emergency department directors. And it just so happened to coincide with, um, with the, the timing of these hearings and, and this discussion. So it was generated by our emergency department affinity group with really just expressing a desire to have a data point that showed the entire picture of people waiting um, for inpatient care, both kids and adults, regardless of legal status and regardless of insurance type. It also came from our pediatric surge group too. It was sort of a confluence of our ED director from our pediatric surge group talking with the other ED directors and um, making it happen. So if, if we hadn't received um, you know, letters from constituents um, we probably would have heard about this issue um, through your organization. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And, and for other issues besides mental health re related to, you know, pandemics or flu-like issues or whatever type of health issues that, that, that come about uh, throughout Vermont, um, are you the front line that sees data from our emergency rooms that would, you know, throw up a red flag to various departments and agencies and say, hey folks, there's something wrong here. We need to do something. Yes. Or is there somebody else? Or is there some other organization? Well, in terms of the emergency departments, yes. So we have a through COVID, it was weekly and bi-weekly meeting of all the emergency department directors across the state. Um, typically it's quarterly, but it's actually worked out really well to have one hour bi-weekly meetings of our emergency department directors via Zoom. And so we will continue to have those frequent check-ins with them. But yes, they bring those issues to us. Um, you know, we have brought the issue of 
wait times in emergency departments to the legislature in the past. We've you know, worked with the legislature in the past on that issue. So this is definitely not a new issue to us. Um, it just does, it appears to be getting worse and the children in waiting emergency departments especially really um, has, a, has a big impact on folks. I mean, no one wants to see adults in the emergency departments waiting for long periods of time either, but um, it creates quite a strain to see a child waiting for that long. Okay. And I guess besides contacting the legislature, there is a process um, that you go through to, um, um, to bring issues up before the agency of human services or Department of Mental Health or what have you, is that correct? Yes, we do meet with the Department of Mental Health monthly um, and discuss issues. And, and who, who sits on that? I mean, who is there uh, from, from those agencies? Is it of anybody, not that, is it somebody that can take action if there's an issue that comes up? Yes, I'm Commissioner Squirrel and Deputy Commissioner Fox are on those calls. Okay. And we appreciate the collaboration. Thank you. Uh, Representative Peterson. Yes, Chair. I, I'd like to ask questions that get into the, the how and why of emergency departments, but I don't want to do it if we're concentrating on data alone. Oh, sorry for the phone. Um, I don't know if now's the time. I don't know what the, the testimony is going to be like. I, I don't want to get into something because I have a number of questions about what is an emergency room visit? Why are they there? How it works and, and all that. Well, let me suggest this. Let me first, before we go, before we go to answer, asking and answering some of those questions, which could actually be useful for others to for all of us to understand how this is thought about by the hospital system. Um, let's first, let me suggest that we first, because we're wanting here to focus particularly on children and children's mental health waiting and children's issues as related to our emergency departments in the hospitals. Let me first turn to Devin Green uh, to provide other information uh, including perhaps a, uh, you know, some, some review of the memorandum that you sent, uh, because one of the things we were looking for was what kind of immediate steps uh, can be taken to address the situation with children, numbers of children, as many at one point apparently as 19 on any given day, and now perhaps as few as either three or six, depending on the numbers, but this is a fluctuating number. Uh, what, is, what are some of the immediate steps that can be taken? And I'd, I'd like to give uh, Voss and Devin Green a chance to share that information with our committee. Thank you. Um, so when I approached this issue, I did approach it with the lens of this being sort of a public health emergency. And so I have put this into the buckets of regulatory flexibility, resources, um, and, and data, and statewide coordination. And I think right now for this body, um, some of the most actionable steps can be taken in the regulatory flexibility piece, um, realizing that providing resources and talking about building and new services uh, takes some amount of planning. Uh, so last week I mentioned the emergency certificate of need for emergency departments or a streamlined, a streamlined process for certificate of needs for uh, emergency departments. I, I did want to correct the record. I said that Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital have been waiting for a long time with their certificate of need. They have not filed their certificate of need yet. They wanted to, um, they wanted to file it as an emergency process and, and that was denied. So they are still in the process of getting to file it. So they have not filed it yet. 
What we're asking for is a process that would be streamlined while taking into account stakeholder input, um, just to take away those barriers to creating therapeutic spaces in emergency departments. Again, with the understanding that an emergency department is never going to be completely therapeutic. It is not a place that we want people to stay long-term, but how can we get them to be more therapeutic? Um, and that often takes building and that building creates a certificate of need process, which takes time. So to the point that we can minimize that time a little bit, I think that would help with some hospitals. Um, can I ask a question about that, just to help understand it? Isn't there a threshold be beyond which, yeah. I mean, if there's a certificate of need, there are things that can be done absent a certificate of need. Yes, but a lot of believe, times- I believe. So there's a, there's, a, there's a financial threshold, I believe, that has yeah. to be hit before you have to file for a certificate of need. Or am I wrong on that? Just like three million or? Yeah, yeah. it's about three million, I believe. Yeah. And a lot of- Seems like a lot can be done absent $3 million without needing an emergency certificate of need exception. Uh, I think it's hard when you talk about emergency departments and when you're talking about creating spaces for people who are in mental health crisis. Because once we get into that, we, we, you may remember, you may recall this from um, Rutland Regional Medical Center um, needing to overhaul their emergency department a couple years ago because regulatory authorities came in and said that there were ligature risks there. So there's, it ends up adding up quickly um, when you have to take into account mental health needs and the ligature risks and the special uh, equipment that you need and the special type of building that you need to address all of the issues there. So, um, so, you know, two rooms ends up uh, costing a fair amount of money for most hospitals and does trigger that certificate of need process. Okay, well, I, I, don't, I don't expect us to sort that out right here, but I was, my first reaction, frankly, was that uh, not knowing, not remembering the threshold, but uh, I, I would still think there's something we could explore there uh, without a certificate of need. But, uh, but let, let me, yeah, I interrupted you. Representative Don, who you had a question or a comment? You're on mute. Uh, yeah, just, just very briefly to say, I think that there are some uh, low cost uh, emergency changes and revisions that can be made that you know, way before you need to do a major right. or pending uh, a more significant change. And it would be really good to see those done, acted upon you know, several years ago, but now would be good. Would be yeah, good. no, and I think that's right. I mean, we are looking internally at what our hospitals can do. We are having our emergency department directors meet with the designated hospitals to talk about the transfer process and medical clearance. Um, you know, we are looking at things that we can do. What I'm bringing- I'm, I'm talking about environment, environment no, no. here in the interim, not just, I mean, movement's I agree. important, but yeah. Yeah, I think the environment of care is the same piece. I, what I brought here today are things, actionable items for, for this group. Um, I'm happy to get into what we are looking to do also, but my understanding was this group was looking for actionable items that you could do, which um, is what I brought here. Okay, well, let me, let me just be clear. We're interested in actionable items that you could do as well. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, I think, frankly, I think, I think we're looking for actionable items by all stakeholders and not just uh, things that require legislative action. No, yeah. seriously, and, and that's not meant as a criticism, but I, we, we are very interested in, because I think, frankly, this is, we're trying to put a spotlight on an issue that is requiring uh, all each stakeholder to see what can they do in the, immediate term uh, to help resolve this. Uh, and even it's not to change in numbers, to, to ch change in the quality of experience. I mentioned coloring books this morning. Well, yeah. I, I, that may be an exaggeration, but when even that is not done, you well, kind of- Yeah, yeah. So again, let's, let, let's, let's, let's complete this, but I'd like to hear, I would like to hear from the hospitals about what, what are actionable items that either are already underway or that could be taken in the very near term. Great. 
Um, so, okay, so I'll continue with this piece yeah. and then I'll move on to the what the hospitals are doing, if that works. Sure, yeah, that's great. Okay, great. Um, the other piece in the regulatory flexibility, I think is already in process, um, just looking at licensing so that we can use telehealth um, uh, to support a, a statewide telehealth program. Uh, there's been some success in places like North Carolina on this. Um, and as you'll see later, we have a real workforce issue um, that is preventing us from providing care. And so that is sort of happening right now in terms of you extending the regulatory flexibilities, which we appreciate. And that will give us the time to look at this issue in H104, um, which you also passed. So thank you for that. Um, and then also transportation. We do hear a lot about transportation um, needs. And, and if we are going to look into alternatives to emergency departments, then we need to be able to have transportation to those alternatives as well. So any regulatory barriers to that, which, you know, maybe at the federal level, um, I know a lot of ambulances get paid only if they bring someone to an emergency department and that is changing at the federal level, but any state barriers to that would be needed as uh, needed to be knocked down as well. Um, we do think that there are resources needed at every level of care. We appreciate uh, DMH's willing or DIVA's willingness to talk to us about a different payment model for emergency departments that would take into account the need for more resources because people are staying longer and we look forward to working with them on that. Um, and we really want to be at the table and dive in with advocates, with all of you, with DMH to look at alternatives to emergency departments um, and and uh, programs that are partial hospitalizations and really strengthen that every level of care so that instead of just, um, you know, just community services and just inpatient, we need more of a spectrum of care for, um, for youth. So, um, and we also need the community services and all the levels of care strengthened as well. So, we would be happy to work on that. And we've uh, brought up the, psychi uh, the psychiatric urgent care for kids in the South and the idea of having one in the North um, and really any, um, any resources in the North, especially the Northeast Kingdom would be helpful. Um, and I mentioned statewide telepsychiatry services, um, but Really, we, we want to continue to work. We think this is an uh, issue among hospitals. We think it's a statewide issue and we wanna to continue to work on it going forward. Um, we hope that there's further statewide coordination. We talked about enhancing the bed board as a way to give us both data and then allow us to have actionable information to see where beds are open, to see what the supply and the, to see what the sort of, how many people are coming in, what is the demand, what's available um, to give us a more detailed picture of what that looks like. And then um, using ED wait times as a, a measurement in these, you know, as we go forward, um, make sure that the ED wait times go down uh, in response to the initiatives that we're taking. And we realize it's not the only measurement, but we do want it to be taken into consideration going forward. And then finally, workforce development. This is a problem throughout the healthcare provider world um, in all different areas, not just mental health. I don't have an easy solution for it, but I do have to highlight it because it's particularly difficult in the world of mental health right now. And, um, and so we are open to discussing uh, workforce initiatives as well. Um, and so, those are the items that we are hoping to work with statewide and at the legislature and with advocates. Um, we internally uh, as, as hospitals um, are doing a couple of different initiatives. I think, um, you know, I mentioned that we are going to look at our medical clearance protocol in terms of what needs to be done in the emergency department to clear that person and say that they're physically able to go to an inpatient unit because 
places like the retreat don't have the capacity to deal with a heart attack or um, other health complications that might also be there while that person is at the hospital. And so they need to get cleared first. Um, and sometimes that process can take a long time. And so we need to minimize that process. We need to do the, you know, the coloring books and the crayons for kids. We need to do the little things. Um, we need to provide comfort for children who are waiting in the emergency departments. I think our our uh, healthcare providers try to do that to the best of their abilities, but as you heard last week, um, the emergency department is a very difficult place and, and not necessarily a place for children to be for long lengths of time. Um, Emma, I know you have uh, some experts that we're bringing in to talk to our hospitals in this area. I don't know if you could go into more detail on that. Sure, and I believe we included some basic details in the brief that we provided, but um, nationally there are um, models called empath units uh, that see rates as high as 70 to 80% diversion, so that, um, and that these places in some states do accept um, involuntary patients as well as voluntary ones. So they really are a place for anybody who's experiencing, experiencing an acute psychiatric emergency can go um, and that they do intensive services and, and warm handoff to community resources so that they can divert um, the majority of their visits back into the community. So we're looking at that as a potential opportunity. Um, we've also highlighted um, there's been proposals by um, a collaboration or a network of peer organizations of Vermont, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, um, Alyssum, Another Way, and um, I am blanking on the fourth <laughs> group, but I think there's been some proposals from the peer community on uh, peer drop-in centers and, and two bed folks who, who need inpatient care um, to give them an alternative to emergency departments. Um, I think that's. I think you might have frozen when you. I think you were saying two bed crisis respite or something to that degree. Is that what? Is that what we didn't hear? Yes. Yeah. So I think there's some, and then psychiatric urgent care for kids, the model that's in Bennington. So I think those there's a lot of um, interesting ideas that are available in Vermont and outside of Vermont that um, look at making um, a continuum of care so that we have something that works in between or is or is a combination of both inpatient and outpatient services um, so that we can we can look for opportunities for diversion to prevent children from arriving in an emergency room and ultimately needing inpatient care. So I think um, being able to serve children and families and better, but also hopefully reduce the need for hospitalization. Great, thank you. So let's take some, thank you, uh, and uh, Devin, let's take some questions. Uh, Representative Donahue, Goldman, and Peterson. I'm just wondering if the hospitals are um, receptive now to considering um, having uh, peer support folks come into the emergency rooms to, you know, be with somebody who's waiting and provide support. Has there been any change in that? Yeah, I think there has been change in that. I can't speak for every hospital. I think it varies hospital to hospital, but I've seen a lot of progress forward with that. And I know we endorsed uh, the certification of peer support, which um, I think will also help hospitals uh, accept peer support coming in and helping out providing a little bit of that certification and, and framework around it will help also. So yeah, I think there is movement in that direction. Is there anything that you, I mean, is that, in order to move forward on such an initiative, is there is that something that the hospitals could do uh, unilaterally or you know on their own without any action taken by other other than the, obviously you need need access to folks who are peers and interested in being part of that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't think there's any, I'm going to let Anne speak to it because she's more of the expert, but I don't see how we would need a legis, you know, we would need legislative action to take advantage of peer services. I, the, I, the only, the only, um, and I, I can't, I'm trying to think of like the current visitation guidance. Um, 
if folks are vaccinated, then they are fine to come in. And I know we said peer services for substance use disorder. I think, I'm not sure if mental health was in there. Um, no, it's excluded from that. And peer, yeah. peer agencies have been trying for more than 10 years to offer voluntary peer support and have in most hospitals um, not been accepted. Um, substance use disorder folks are admitted as peer support people. I will, I will say that the emergency department directors have been more motivated than I've ever seen to work with peer support and their community providers and, you know, try to figure out solutions to this and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Um, Representative Goldman, Representative Peterson. Well, actually, before we go on, let me just say, I would be interested if there, if you, I'd be interested in understanding what is experienced by the hospitals from your end as to what are the barriers to uh, implementing peer support uh, around mental health issues, whether there's perceived changes that are needed in order to make that more possible. Because we, again, been hearing about it for a long time and it seems like it's something which perhaps whose time has come uh, or maybe maybe it should have come earlier, but it's at least should be happening now. And if there's perception as to what that what the barriers are, I, I would be interested in having you share that with us uh, as one of the stakeholders, even if it doesn't require action on our part. Yeah, and what I'd like to do is consult with our ED directors. We have a meeting at um, on Friday, and I can get that, or I could email them out, but I'd, I'd want to hear more from them before no. making some guesses. No, of course, of course, but I think it's an important issue. Uh, Representative Peterson, or Representative Goldman, whoever was first in the queue. I don't know, but I'll go, mine's quick. Um, Emma, I think I heard you say something about an issue brief that you provided to us, and I was wondering about that. Um, cause I'm not sure I've seen it or if I did, I don't remember it. And you muted. Uh, I, I just, I just forwarded them to everyone. So you have them in your email. Oh, thank the you. ones that we have received thus far. Wait, you're talking, I, I think we're talking past each other. Uh, there, there's, there's the emergency point in time briefs, but I think, I think what Emma, I believe what you were referring to is I have a printed copy is, is the memorandum, uh, which actually doesn't have a date. I don't think, but. It's uh, around testimony for children and adolescents in mental health crisis and emergency departments from VAS. Is that, that what you're referring to, Emma? And I think, I think all members of the committee should have that document. It's posted also on our website. But Can if you, you don't... Can you the date of that? Well, I don't know. There's not a date on it, but it's, uh, it was distributed, I think, in the last week. Okay. You look under documents on the website and you look under uh, VAS. Okay. Uh, you know, where the report came from. I'm, I'm sure thank Colleen you. can help locate it. Um, thank you. Uh, Representative Peterson? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I have a, just a fundamental question, a number of them really, but I'll limit it to a, a couple, three here, about what happens in an emergency room and ch children with, with mental health issues. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering why, why they're in the emergency room. I'm, I'm trying to make sense of emergency room use for this purpose. Uh, if, if a child is, unless they're chronic, but if somebody had a chronic mental health issue, wouldn't they have a, a provider that they would go to in the event of something? If it's not that, if if this is a first time event, a child is, I don't know, really has an episode of, of a problem, say a, a 10 year old, and a parent brings them to the emergency room, is the holdup in not having a care provider, a, a psychiatrist, psychologist work with that child? Is that where the holdup is? The manpower needed to see the child or is it somewhere else? So, and I'll, I'll take a first 
attempt at this and I'll look to Devin, but I would say we have a healthcare system that by and large says, if you're experiencing an emergency, call 911. And when 911 is called, usually the next stop if it is an emergency room. And so we also have a, a, a narrative um, beyond just healthcare, but just, you know, a narrative that we all have that says when we're experiencing an emergency and we can't, we can't contact our provider because it's after hours or we don't have a provider in this area, we go to the emergency room. Um, other conditions have urgent care. So, you know, I make an assessment as an individual whether I need to stop at my urgent care or whether I need to go to my emergency room. We don't always have that level for mental health. So I would say sometimes um, it's, you know, families who maybe are experiencing a crisis for the very first time and don't know how to access the system. So they, they lean on what is most familiar, which is what we use for almost everything else in healthcare. And other times, and I think the testimony we heard from families two weeks ago, um, we have children who have a really acute need um, and they may not have the resources in the community or those resources may not be available at off hours to support families. And so families are told if they need a place where someone can stay that is safe um, and staffed 24 seven, that's an emergency department. So I think we have a cultural narrative that tells us emergency departments are where we take emergencies. Um, but there are really creative ideas that I think we've presented today that other states have looked at and things that we could use in Vermont to create alternatives other than emergency rooms. And um, I also think the advent of 988, the, the suicide hotline or the uh, 911 equivalent for mental health crisis could help us create different networks or different pathways for referral when people are experiencing a mental health crisis. So I think that's my perspective. I, I, I'd be curious, and I think we could take it back to our emergency department directors from a little more of a clinical perspective, but I think it's cultural as well as resource related. Okay, so I, I see what you're saying. So one way to get a, to help that would be to have, have, a, have another avenue to send that family to that child to uh, a call, oh, it's a, it's a mental health issue, you would go here to the park like they have down in Bennington. Um, yes. That type of thing that would clear out the, the, the or keep the uh, ED from being over over uh, filled with folks. And I do um, wanna emphasize that I think Puck is really promising because it's an extra resource for co the community, but it's also very promising because it, it takes the typical referral networks for children and it turns them up side down and it says to the whole Bennington community, if you have a child who's experiencing a mental health crisis or an issue in schools, do not call law enforcement, do not send them to the emergency department, call us first. So that partnership and that collaboration and that, that effort to change the narrative and change the referral pattern, I think is, is as important as creating the extra resource for families and children. Yes, I, I was very impressed with the testimony we heard on that. Now. The other question I have is, do, do your emergency hospital emergency rooms have an on-call mental health clinician, person, doctor? Do you have someone, some, some child comes in, he's there, got a problem, got to be handled. You call this uh, person in and they take care of it. Is that how it works? So I think it's different from emergency department to emergency department. So uh -huh. larger hospitals that have outpatient psychiatry programs or um, have inpatient psychiatric units upstairs have better access to mental health resources. Um, hospitals and designated agencies have different ways that they work together that varies from hospital to hospital. So that's another resource that can be brought in. So I think it, I think it truly does depend. Um, so the smaller hospitals may not have, the, definitely do not have the same level of access to mental health specialty and psychiatry as, as our larger hospitals. And that's a function and, and, of, oh, that's just a ahead, function no, of, a, yeah, that's just a function of a rural hospital system. So our rural hospitals don't have a pediatric wing that they send children up to if they can't, uh, you know, if they need special pediatric surgery and it's more than just uh, 
you know, giving a child IV and releasing them. There's, we, because we are a rural state and due to workforce, we can't have every service at every hospital. And so we have this system of emergency departments that then triage and transfer to appropriate places. Okay, are, are we finding that there are more children waiting at small hospitals and large for for uh, mental health issues or no? No, I think, okay. Um, we only have three weeks worth of data, so we don't have anything to indicate a trend, but I would say by and large, most children, um, most visits that we are seeing waiting are at our larger hospitals um, and smaller it's also, counts. It's also where our populations are. Right. <laughs> Now, that being said, we do see, um, and again, more weeks of data will help us tell this story a little bit better, but when we see children and adults waiting in smaller hospitals, um, it, it creates more, it's more likely that a smaller hospital will have a higher percentage of their overall beds occupied by folks waiting for mental health care than larger hospitals. So even though the numbers can be smaller, at smaller EDs, it's a greater proportion of their overall bed. So it can it can create a strain. I mean, we have some emergency departments that are um, five beds, others that are 10, and our larger hospitals, it's anywhere from 25 to 40. So there's a lot of variation in, in just the resources overall that, that emergency departments have. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna suggest that uh, we hear from Jack McCullough uh, next, and hopefully Devin and Emma will be able to stay with us. Um, and we'll turn to Jack to hear some of your perspective from your years of work uh, with the mental health system here in Vermont. Okay, uh, thank I'll leave you. you to introduce yourself, Jack. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Jack McCullough. I'm an attorney at Vermont Legal Aid, and for about the last 26 years or so, I've been the director of our mental health law project. And the function of the mental health law project is to defend the legal rights of patients in the involuntary mental health system. So by contract, we are automatically appointed by the court to represent anyone in any involuntary mental health proceeding in the entire state. And uh, so we represent people in every hospital in Vermont in which people are receiving involuntary psychiatric uh, care. We represent uh, people in every county who are getting uh, care in community settings. We represent uh, adults and we represent children. And um, so we have a lot of experience with the kinds of issues we've been talking about. Um, I've observed over many years in this committee that the mental health system seems to be determined, or maybe I should see, say fated, to instill, instill in Vermonters with psychiatric illnesses the uh, perception that the mental health system is not here to help them but to do things to them. And this is another example of that uh, observation. It seemed to get really bad at the beginning of this year. You know, in the last several years, we've certainly seen people being stuck in emergency departments. This year, especially for children, it seemed to get really bad. With children's had children being held for days um, sometimes even weeks in emergency departments. And when I say children, we do definitely find ourselves representing children under 10 years of age, sometimes significantly under 10 years of age. But a, a lot of the children that we represent are, are adolescents. And, you know, you tend to you know, we all know teenagers and we know uh, how we interact with teenagers. And we sometimes find even the teenagers we're representing who are being held in voluntarily to be crying, fearful, really desperate because of the uh, 
situation they're in. They're being held. They don't know what's going to happen. And uh, <clears throat> it it sort of seems like, you know, it's hard to know, but uh, when, um, when we have children in the hospital and being held involuntarily, they don't necessarily seem to have the same orientation that adults have to the idea that I have rights, I have the ability to speak up for my rights and I have the ability to have somebody uh, help me stand up for my rights. And so they often tend to just sort of accept whatever's being done to them. And it really, uh, if anything, it really makes them even more desperate in the, in the, where they find themselves. And it also makes us, we hear from children and parents that they're less willing to ask for help when they do need it because of the terrible experience they had uh, the, the last time they went through it. Um, not every hospital is the same, but you go there and it's been a long time since I've had the chance to visit a, a client in a hospital, but you go there into the emergency departments and you see a person in a tiny windowless room, not free to move around or interact with the, with other people or to go outside. There's a staff person sitting on the out, outside the room at a computer terminal, watching the person, not necessarily interacting with them in any way. And it really is uh, far from what any of us would think of as a humane or compassionate way to uh, treat someone in a psychiatric crisis. I know it's hard in these times to uh, to arrange something like this, but I would really urge the committee to get out and visit one or two of these emergency departments to really witness uh, what conditions are like there. Um, and so to give you an overview of the legal uh, structures we work in, the law does allow people, either adults or minors, to be taken into custody if the person is found to be mentally ill and a danger to him or herself or others. And when I say found to be, I mean observed to be by a mental health clinician, not necessarily found by court at this point. The purpose of the involuntary custody, and you have probably heard this referred to as the 72 hour hold process. The purpose of this involuntary custody is not only to contain the person, to prevent them from doing something dangerous, but, uh, but also provide, uh, provide psychiatric care. And uh, it can only be justified really, in my view, if the person is provided with the treatment needed to address the, uh, the psychiatric crisis that they're facing. A child who's locked in this tiny windowless room with no real uh, therapeutic care is not receiving meaningful psychiatric care. And so we question how the state can, uh, can justify involuntarily detaining that person. And in our cases, what we've been doing you know, you've, I'm sure you've heard the term psychiatric boarding. Well, hospitals aren't there to board, provide room and board for people. They're there to provide care for people. And in cases like this, where someone is simply locked up in an emergency department, we've, uh, we've begun filing uh, motions to dismiss the uh, application for involuntary treatment, arguing to the court that the, the state can only justify keeping the person if they're going to provide treatment for them. And keeping them locked up in an emergency department is not uh, treatment. Um, we talk about parity in the mental health system. It's been the policy of the uh, Vermont law for many years to have parity between psychiatric and physical conditions. Would we tolerate a state of affairs in which 
someone's admitted to the emergency department with a heart attack or other medical crisis, and they're told, we're gonna keep you in the emergency department for several days until there's a cardiac bed that opens up to treat you. Obviously that would be intolerable for any other type of care. It should be intolerable for psychiatric care as well. Um, there are a couple of issues that I, that I think are immediate issues that we could talk about. One problem we've noticed is that in our cases for both children and adults, even after an application for involuntary treatment is filed and the person is transferred to a psychiatric hospital, there can be a considerable delay between the time the person gets to the new hospital and the time the uh, attorney general's office files a motion for change of venue. You know, the case will have been filed in Orleans or Chittenden or whatever county the, the person is immediate, initially admitted to, but then when they're transferred to the retreat, the case needs to be transferred to Wyndham County. The judiciary has now has created this electronic file system where the official case file in any case is the electronic file, not a paper file, but still the receiving court can't do anything with the case until a motion of venue, change of venue is filed and the case is now officially located in the receiving court. So one thing that could be done immediately is the attorney general's office could be filing the motion for change of venue as soon as the patient is transferred from the emergency department to whatever the new county is. Um, we've, brought, we've brought that up with them. They, they may be getting better, but I, I can't see any justification that there's any delay at all in filing those motions. Um, another thing that we've noticed, and this is something that's more of a question than a factual assertion, because I'm not certain that it's true, but uh, um, we've repeatedly had clients, uh, children who've been admitted to emergency departments um, being held for a period of time and uh, they wind up being transferred to the Brattleboro retreat and immediately or almost immediately being discharged. And it seems that uh, some of the general hospitals, either the emergency departments or the general hospitals um, have the impression that they don't have the authority to discharge an involuntary patient before they're transferred to the retreat to have the uh, have a psychiatrist at the retreat to evaluate the patient and uh, and make the decision to discharge. Before I came here today, I uh, I've been emailing with Devin Green and Emma Harrigan to see if they know the answer to the question. They're going to help me uh, find the answer to that because if. The person's being, if a child's being held just for the purpose of having a, a psychiatrist retreat, say they're okay to go home, there's, there's no justification for that. And so if, if that continues to be a problem, we, <laughs> that seems like another thing that we can, whether it's a miscommunication between the hospitals and the Department of Mental Health or what, that seems like something that can be addressed uh, immediately. Um, and I think that is pretty much it for me. I think what we found is that the situation is intolerable. It doesn't seem to be getting better. Although I should say after, uh, after this morning's hearings, I, uh, hearing, I discussed the testimony I heard with the, uh, with my staff, and it does seem that the the department's figure of only three people, three children in emergency departments as of today, that does appear to be correct based on the uh, 
the number of cases that we have open. So, so that's good. Um, but I think that's, that's it for me. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So Jack, I'm gonna jump in here. Uh, thank you. Just to be clear, you deal only with involuntary uh, patients. Is that correct? Exactly. We get uh, right. So I think people need to understand that 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 yeah. you, you you work with a particular uh, sub a group of patients uh, who are seeking or someone seeking on their behalf mental health treatment. They may not be seeking it themselves. Uh, right. And, and then that's, that's the group that you deal with. Can just knowing that, uh, can you, cause I think one of the questions that's been raised before is what are the numbers? And I don't know who's tracking this. Uh, maybe the department actually is cause they deal with their, they've been tracking the involuntary uh, patients uh, not, and not always the voluntary patients. And what are the numbers of children? And I'll say you can define it uh, by, under eight, under eighteen, or uh, whatever. Uh, what are the num What is the proportionality or numbers of children who are in a part of the involuntary mental health uh, treatment system that you that you deal with? Do, do you do you, have, do you do you have any numbers that can shed light on that? We do. I'd, I'd like to confirm it before uh, giving you a fixed number, but I think the number that I got from my secretary the other day was uh, 42 in 2021. 42 yes. in 2021. And can you put that in some perspective as to the total number of persons that you would have dealt with in that same period so that there's some proportionality? It, it's a small percentage. We uh, we have, we tend to get in the neighborhood of 1,500 or probably more cases per year of all of our cases. So 42, if you, if you expect, uh, expand that over the year, it might be 120 or so. So it's, it's a small percentage of the cases that we do. And um, so that's 42 in, to this point in 2021. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So that's not, a, that's not an annual number. Correct. An annual number could would be uh, would be more than that, three or four times that. I'm not sure exactly what the cutoff date was. I will get you that exact number. Yeah, I think that would be useful for because I think it, it becomes and and this those are I mean proportionally that's a small number, but that's not a small number really uh, when you think about it in Vermont. That it's a lot of kids who are in crisis. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of a lot of children who are uh, in a situation that is not just a crisis, but is also a crisis where there's considered danger to themselves or others and there's a mental illness. And I can, another thing I can say is that it's the cases we have in which we're representing children tend to be much less likely to go to hearing than cases where we were representing adults. Typically, that once they get into, get hospitalized, they work with the, uh, with the treatment team at the hospital, they work on developing a placement and not many of them wind up going through the, the whole commitment process. They eventually get discharged without being committed. Which is probably a good thing all the way around for everyone. Oh, I agree. Yeah. yeah. So you don't have this stigma that, I mean, there's stigma, but there's not the same stigma perhaps. Right. Okay. Uh, questions for Jack McCullough. Um, Representative Black. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm not even really sure this is a question. Um, and and anyone, can, anyone can address it or not address it, but all day long today, as we've been going through this, I, and Mr. McCullough, you sort of reminded me when you said something that you thought might anecdotally, anecdotally be happening. I, I just keep thinking, how did we go from 19 kids to three kids in two weeks. Did we, are we doing things that we should have been doing all along? Or are we making space for some 
at the expense of others. And I'm not sure, or is it just a coincidence that this has been, you know, on the radar for the last two weeks and it's gotten better? I'm yeah. Being cynical. And like I said, it's not really a question, but. An observation. With it's a question. an observation. May I dive in a little bit to that? Please, Thank you. please. welcome you too. Devin Green, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. I would just say um, I wouldn't hang my hat on it yet. I think you see that the data fluctuates from what DMH showed you. Um, we only have three data points, so we can't say what is happening right now or whether there was an intervention that helped. I think it's just a matter of, and again, it matters in our point in time, right? Which is why we try to include the anecdotes that say someone who is waiting here for eight days just left 30 minutes ago um, to create a larger picture. But um, I don't think we can say what made that change at this point. And Emma, I don't know if you have anything to add. Thank you, Devin. I think you covered it. Um, we only have three data points, so we can't really say for sure what the trend is, but we can say when we look at emergency department visits over time at, on a yearly basis versus week by week, we have seen increases with each year in the number of visits and the number of days that, that those patients are waiting. And that, that number does include kids and adults, so I don't have a good sense of how the the children's picture has specifically changed over time. Um, and I will also say the kids number that we've provided has gone from six to 19 to six again, but the adult number has been much more static um, at, I don't wanna say off the top of my head, but in the teens to the twenties with each of the past three weeks that we've reported. So we are hoping that more weeks of data will help us understand more of a trend. And when you put this on top of the data that we've provided, going a little bit further back, um, this is at the top of, of a very long increase of overall visits and days to emergency departments in Vermont. It's also, um, yeah. yeah, it's a, I think Representative Black's question is one that's crossed other minds as well. Uh, and I, I want to just put out there, uh, you know, in some ways I regret that I didn't make make it more of a an issue earlier in the this legislative session, but at one point I raised with some of my colleagues here that I wanted to see us try to establish a goal of what, I mean, to, 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 to challenge all of us as stakeholders to say, what would it take for there to be no child waiting in any emergency department for mental health services, period. And I still think that's the goal that we should establish. I think that that's the measure that we should have and that when we deviate from that, we need to understand why we're not, or why we're not accomplishing that. Uh, because we, I mean, I'm, I'm just getting on my own soapbox, but I think, you know, we've heard enough testimony and I think we know enough to know that there's nothing therapeutic about being uh, kept in a non-therapeutic setting in an emergency department, despite the best intentions and best efforts of those who are operating in difficult situations. And I don't attribute motive, uh, personally, I don't attribute motive to anyone working in our emergency departments, uh, but I think we need to collectively and I think that's part of our role as the legislature, quite honestly. I don't think our, our role is not always just to pass statutes or to, uh, uh, there, there are times when the role of, of our work is to shine a light on an issue and to use that to convene or mobilize stakeholders other than ourselves and in addition to ourselves around it, an issue. And I think that's how I see this situation at this point in time. I think there are numbers of specific suggestions and some midterm suggestions that we will, as a committee, uh, try to identify, you know, to collect from different stakeholders who have testified and identify and to, and to work with the department 
one of the things that I, I, I want to take from this is that I want to work, I, I want us have the department work to identify timelines and goals and measures for implementing uh, and tracking whether we're successful in implementing some of the issues that we've identified as achievable. Some of the most immediate ones, including some that Jack mentioned, which are less, I mean, frankly, I, I, you know, I think most people couldn't begin to come up with the specifics that, that were articulated there because they're, they're very much in the legal world weeds. But when you do, when you, when you put a number of small pieces in place, it can begin to make a difference. And we know that there's some things that need to be done in the medium term, or medium term that need to be set in motion now. Um, but I, I personally would just, I think collectively we, we should challenge ourselves to uh, have a goal of no child waiting in an emergency department for mental health treatment. And we should err in the direction of having the resource that allows that to be the measure, the successful measure that there may be times when we don't actually use every resource because in fact, we're successful. Uh, but um, so let, let me say, so we have a number of questions still. Um, I'm gonna suggest that we continue to take questions and then we, um, I think, well, let's do that and then we'll see what we do next. Okay, uh, Representative Goldman, I, I think I seen hands just Representative Goldman, uh, Jack McCullough and Representative Peterson, is your hand still up or is that a, a new hand. In any case, Representative Goldman, go right ahead. Well, I was last, so I think okay. <laughs> it's, it's hard for me to that. tell on this screen. Sorry. Okay, I'll go. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Take, um, take, take your turns. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I was the first one, but and it doesn't matter. Um, I, I'm still tr I'm trying to get to, and Mr. McCullough raised some. Uh, painted a picture of, of kids in a windowless room sitting there and I'm trying to figure out where the holdup is. It, it, and, and Devin, you've talked about workforce issue. Are we saying we don't have enough mental health workers to take care of kids that come in? Is, is, that, where, is that where the rubber meets the road, okay? A child comes in with a parent, um, you know, with a real problem. It would seem someone would, in, in any kind of hospital, somehow, somewhere would get a hold of someone that could, on call or not, come in and take care of that child's need. Now, if the child can go home somehow, then they go home. If they have to stay, then that's another issue I guess we have to address is, is room or place or where or how um, that individual would get there. But it sounds like it's straight manpower issue. We just don't have people. Have I got that right or am I way off base? I, I, I'm trying to understand it. Well, can I jump in here and say, I don't think you're completely off base because there are 500 vacancies across the community mental health system generally. And so we're trying to address that through workforce issues. I mean, we've been coming at this issue, not just for children, but generally for, for a period of years now. And there is a mental health workforce uh, shortage. That's not, but I don't think that's the key issue uh, in this instance. That's not the only uh, key issue. It's also, as I think Representative Peterson, I think what we're hearing and what we know from testimony is that there's also a shortage of alternative uh, settings from emergency rooms. Uh, so someone who comes to an emergency room, in fact, may not be able, based on evaluation, and Representative Chena can probably speak to this because he's, he's actually one of the people that is, participates at some level of evaluation, uh, but based on an evaluation that it's not appropriate for the child and the family to have the child go home with the family at that time. The question okay. is, where can they go okay. and not sit in an emergency room, which is a very highly technical, highly uh, skilled, very expensive uh, setting to your, really respond to uh, physical healthcare emergencies primarily. Uh, but if you don't have, if we don't have a, an opening in, an, in a, a respite 
bed or in an alternative setting where there are staff already there working with children and families, then there's no place to quote, transfer them to. So they sit in the emergency room until the bed opens up in this alternative setting. Okay. And that's part of what we've been pushing for as a committee and the department is committing to as well to try to create more settings in the community for children and families, <laughs> uh, but not just at the front end, like the puck, the puck is a, is a, is a prior to getting, to keep people from going to the emergency room, but we also need settings for children to go to once they've been in the emergency room or once, or once they've been at puck and they're identified, they need more than can be provided there. They need someplace other than an emergency room. So okay. I think we, we have, uh, and I think we heard the commissioner say there are resources that can be put to those. Uh, we, we're fortunate there are uh, some substantial federal resources that can be used and that that's in, that is underway and in the process. Um, so it's, it's, it's a combination, it's, it's a system. And just as this commissioner said, it is a systemic issue, but it requires movement in different parts of the system uh, simultaneously. And we're, we're trying to move that system and, that, and the department is trying to move that system. Uh, but it's not strictly just like there's literally not manpower in the emergency room. Although okay. there, is a man, there is a, is, there's a shortage of psychiatrists there's a short, so we need to t you have telepsychiatry. There's a shortage of staffing in the community system generally because we have chronically underfunded the system. Uh, so anyway, it goes, so it's, it's all these different pieces that fit together. And okay. in some ways, I think someone said at one point, and I think it's, a, it's maybe not a completely accurate analogy or metaphor, but in some ways, children waiting long times in an emergency room setting is a little bit like the canary in the coal mine. It's like, it's a symptom. It says there's something not working in this whole system when children end up waiting in non-therapeutic settings in an emergency department for failure to be able to get to an appropriate setting. And it's not just a matter of changing the emergency room settings to have them be more amenable, et cetera. That, that's, that's part of it, but that's, that's, not, that's a symptom rather than a solution long-term solution that, that's 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 my well let me just say that that is thank you for that because that helps a novice like myself in this environment i'm trying to learn understand where the problem is because I, I i haven't heard that expressed quite that way and, and that uh, registered with me so uh, thank you and I, I would just say, I appreciate your questions as a novice to this, because in fact, it actually asks some of the questions that people would be asking who are not immersed in this system. So I, Representative Peterson, I actually appreciate and value your asking some of the questions which uh, need to be asked. And I wanna follow up with one other thing, and then I wanna hear it from the other members who have questions. I think it would be useful at some point in time, given everything else we've gotta do, but you know, we'll, it, and it may not happen immediately, but somewhere along the way, I think it would be very illuminating to have our committee hear from folks who are actually working in emergency room settings to talk about, to answer the question you have. I mean, I have a picture in my head, but it may not be current or most complete to hear like, what is it that's bringing children to the emergency room settings and what are you seeing? What are you doing? What are you not able to do? To actually hear from the frontline people, I think that would be illuminating for us, whether it leads to a specific intervention or not. I think the information would be useful from uh, your perspective, Representative Peterson. I think it would be actually useful to all of us. And I'm going to turn to Representative Tina, who actually has feet in multiple worlds here uh, and actually has some of the more direct experience than, than many of us. So. Thanks. Representative Chino, welcome can you. Can you hear me okay right now? Because I'm using a different sound system than usual. I actually can hear you very well. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, I am a, you know, I am a part-time crisis clinician at the Howard Center, and I've been one since 2004. So that's 17 years. Um, so I've seen like a lot of changes and I've seen a lot of things stay the same. Um, and I will say that, oh, you, um, what the chair just said about there's nowhere safe for someone to go is often the barrier. Like there's not, the bed's not open yet. 
that they need. They're unsafe to go home and there's nowhere to go other than staying where you are, but it's not, the, it's not a therapeutic environment and people languish. Um, and I think part of the problem is, I, I'm gonna say something and then I do have actually have questions, but, sure. um, I, but I've, it seems like people are sharing thoughts too, so I will. Mm -hmm. um, and you literally just said we should hear from frontline workers in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. So, um, so um, and I say this with all due respect, but like part of the problem is the infrastructure and part of the problem is, is like the culture. And like, pe the, like people get inconsistent treatment. Like, like what a person's gonna get from me may not be the same thing they're gonna get from another crisis worker. And sometimes people get like, I sit in the back room and hear how people are talked about by providers. And it's, it's concerning to me. Um, and in, in that position, I, I'll advocate for clients and I'll speak up. And then sometimes I just have to be quiet and do my work because I'm not gonna change someone else's mind um, for the judgment they made about a person and how they're gonna treat them. Um, so I think one thing we could do is look at how to address burnout and staff and look at having more consistent training and, and like standards between people. And part of that's probably within a program. Part of that's, it's not like, I'm, when I say providers, like there's so many different providers in the emergency room working together. Like there's, there's mental health crisis workers like myself, there's like the uh, peer substance abuse support people, there's nurses, there's doctors, there's residents, there's um, the sitters and, depending what sitter you get, you're gonna get a different experience. Like it's, it's just inconsistent treatment. Um, and so a few questions I have is, um, have we ever considered, I'm, I'm just gonna say them and then be quiet and listen and continue digest, cause I'm trying to listen and, and reflect too in this moment. Um, have we ever considered, we meaning like our society or whatever, have we ever considered having UVM create an inpatient unit for adolescents, because I keep hearing they can go to Plattsburgh, but that doesn't really work well for people. And, and when there's like nine kids in the emergency room at UVM, it just doesn't make sense that we can't move some of them into the hospital if they really need that level of care. The second thing is, could there be some kind of mobile therapy program that begins therapy in the emergency room or in some adjacent unit, kind of like a, like a, like a, like more intensive than just giving them puzzles and books and like, and like juices and putting a video on, like having like, like similar to like how on the inpatient unit, there's the activity staff, you know, people who could be like a little more um, interactive. And then the last question is, have we ever considered like sending them home with a sitter? You know, like, like, a pers like, like a person goes to the home and stays at the family's home and stays awake and sits with that child in their own home and helps the family kind of like a visiting nurse or a visiting social worker and sits with the family at home until the vet opens, you know, because I'm just trying to be creative about like, how do we address this? And that's a, that's a question that I thought of while you were just talking. Thank you. I don't know there's answers to your questions, I, but I think the questions need to be out there. And I think the kind of things that you're asking about are the kinds of things that I would hope and want uh, both the hospitals and the department to be participating in as key stakeholders uh, to think creatively. Because in fact, we have a history in Vermont of thinking outside the box and thinking creatively uh, about how to uh, keep people in their home settings. And this is another instance where, uh, and anyway, I, I could go on, I, over the years I, I've watched uh, us take initial, um, efforts in one part of the state and then try to find a way to move those uh, successful efforts into other parts of the state, everything from parent-child centers. We didn't used to have a system of parent-child centers uh, and we now do. Uh, we, we, I mean, intensive family-based services were an innovative model at one point in time and now they're in, intensive family-based services is something that we think of as an essential piece of intervention with certain certain levels of, of need. Uh, and I think some of the things you've talked about, uh, I think there's things we can learn. And I, I would, I don't, we're not here to do that today, but I think we're here to identify who can best be the crucible for thinking about new uh, 
to continue to think about, because give credit where credit is due, the department has been thinking about and working on numbers of these issues. This is not like they, they have not been part of this, but I think we, we need to add to that and add our sense of external urgency around this. So with that, um, so Brian, I'm not trying to, I don't know if others want to respond to your particular suggestions or questions. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't expect answers right now. There's sort of things that I've been like, as I'm listening to the discussion that have, that are that it came up and I just thought I'll put it out there. And if people can't answer it today, at least it's out there, you know, and, and, and people, we can maybe be thinking a little more creatively. Um, not that we haven't, because I, I do want to say that in the, the 17 years I've worked, there's all kinds of improvements um, and all kinds of things that have gotten better. But they, there also are some things that just aren't changing and it's not okay. So. I'm going to turn to Representative uh, uh, Donahue and then Representative Goldman or whatever order. Uh, it's just, just a quick comment, because uh, if it were adult mental health, I would have remembered to say this a whole lot earlier, but I'm hearing about meetings, VAS, DMH, emergency directors and all that, and I strongly encourage involving peer voices at every table, and in this case, that means parents. There is a, we, the, the uh, head of the Family Federation couldn't make it today to testify here, but I know Digger talked with her. She was talking about, um, you know, opportunities and ideas and that voice needs to be at the table from, from day one, not with here's our plan, what do you think of it? Um, and there is a state standing committee on children's mental health. Um, Great. Thank you. And I, I'm, I'm aware that uh, Sandy and I was not able to join us today, but I'm, uh, Colleen, you're listening here as well. I'm wondering if reaching out to her and seeing if she's available to join us uh, when we have some further discussion tomorrow afternoon, whether that's a possibility. Okay, uh, Representative Goldman, and then, um, then let me stop and think about how we proceed from here. I want to thank you, Chair Lippert, because you said something really important that got my attention, which was you wanted to set a goal of no child in the ER for mental health issue. I think that's a really important goal, but I think it needs a time frame. So, you know, this is a big system, but I would want somehow to say by one year from today or by somehow we put the pressure on to say, and I don't know if we do this as a committee, and of course, you know, I don't know how this whole system works about this mental health, you just said a mental health um, group that already exists. How do we fix it in a time frame that we can live with? Because it's not gonna be next week. And obviously it's been going on for years. I would like to see goals that have a time frame so that we can know whether we're reaching that goal. So. I want to thank you for that. I'd like to put a time frame on it. I'd like to say, you know, tomorrow, can't do that. I'd like to say by the end of the summer, can we do that? Uh, hopefully COVID will be over. The school supports will be back in place. Um, can we really look and say in six months because schools will be back in session and kids will get the support that there won't be kids in the ER. If there are, we then have backups that we need already wait, you know, ready to go. So. I would like to see a time frame. Thank you. So I'm aware of the time, uh, and I'm also aware. So I think there's some been very some very fruitful testimony and conversation here this afternoon. I think a next step, from my point of view, picks up on what uh, not just what Representative Goldman said and what I suggested, but from I think there's, I think one of the roles, in addition to shining a light, bringing this issue uh, to the forefront again, uh, and not saying, oh, it's now six, so we can back off, it's not 19 anymore. Uh, I think it, what I've learned over time in this process is it also requires persistence and commitment over time, uh, regardless of the issue. This happens to be an issue, I think, which engages many of us. Uh, it doesn't mean we're not in co committed to other issues, even related mental health issues, including adults in the mental health uh, wor world. Uh, but I, I want to I suggest that um, my sense, help, help, I'm, I'm trying to do the committee now for this, but I'm thinking 
that rather than trying to turn our attention to trying to uh, bring together specific recommendations at this point in time, that we might step back. We have scheduled some time tomorrow afternoon on our agenda. Uh, I think this, the floor may be such that we can actually achieve that and that we come back and have some committee discussion based on what we've heard, based on some of the ideas that have been put forward and try to then see if there's what, what our role is in terms of, excuse me, what our role is as a committee in terms of taking next steps. Uh, because it's, as I say, it's not always statutory. It's sometimes, there's different ways for us to influence change. Um, my, my sense is that the, while there's good energy, there's also, it's late in the day to begin that process right now. So I'm going to suggest that we not try to do that right now, not to try to avoid it, but because I think we'll be more able to with maybe a little more fresh, fresh energy. Um, and, and I think I'd like to take a five minute break before, and so I saw, Jack, are you, you're, you're, is that your hand raised? Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Yes, thank you. I just want to- Because I'm, I'm on the verge of bringing this to a close for the afternoon <laughs> in terms of this topic. So that, I wanted to open up and say, is there any last comments? <clears throat> Great, thank you. I, I know the focus of today has been on, and this week has been on children in emergency departments. I just want to say, Mr. Chairman, I agree with exactly with what you said that there should be we should be in a situation where there are no children waiting for psychiatric care in emergency departments, but we should also bring about an outcome in which there are no adults waiting in emergency departments yeah. for psychiatric care. I'm sure you, agree. I know you agree with that. I completely agree. But I also, but I also think strategically, we need to put attention in a particular place. And my, my experience also is if you move part of the system forward, you may, you may very well move the entire system forward simultaneously, but you'll be more effective. Yep. If, I think we will be more effective if we put continue to focus attention and energy on this. I, I will add one other thing, because I, I, I'm struggling as I'm listening. Uh, some of us, I think Representative Donahue and myself, and maybe others, I'm, apologies for forgetting, uh, we were approached by Spectrum Youth and Family Services uh, some many months ago around uh, them because they work with youth, but they work with transitional youth who are sometimes older than 18, but younger than 21. I don't know what the official de denotation is. And I'm wondering, I find myself wondering in terms of the data and understanding who we're talk talking about, that there's particularly unique, I think there may be unique needs of transitional youth or <laughs> they might be transitional young adults uh, however you think about it. And I'm wondering whether we're capturing really the magnitude of what we're talking about in terms of what is uh, happening in our emergency departments uh, when we just say youth. And I'm, I'm, Emma, my, in terms of your numbers, it's it under 18 or 18 and under. And, um, but that means someone who's 19 or 18 years in a, and, uh, or 19 in a day or something like that, you could, there are many young people who are, particularly if they're homeless, if they have no housing, if they have no family supports, uh, they are really not in the adult world in the same way as someone who's like even 25 or, th or, or 30 and has a whole different world around them or may. I mean, not everybody does. But I guess I'm wanting to, to also acknowledge that there's a transitional youth segment of the population that I think maybe doesn't get captured as we talk about youth as 18 and under. Right, they're, they're all counted as adults and that includes um, treatment settings as well. So inpatient yeah, hospitalization. So it's, it's probably a broader they, issue. They all, at 18, it's all the adult system and numbers. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Representative Page, I see your hand. Uh, welcome you to chime I'll in. I'll just be quick, but I just want to re um, remind everyone that so long ago this morning, we did have a presentation by um, Commissioner Squirrel, and she did have um, some immediate solutions, yeah. midterm and long term. And I don't know whether uh, Devin or the others were listening in, uh, what they think of those solutions, whether whether we think they're going to work. 
uh, whether there should be more work done on them. And I, I guess I, I'm putting you on the spot and I don't want to do that, but I'm just, I just want to remind the committee. We did hear some, some thoughts yes. from the commissioner and I'm not so certain that they're, they're the right ones. And I, I will also add, um, and maybe I'm sticking my neck out on this, but our Secretary of Human Services made some comments and maybe he was misquoted uh, about how, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't react um, to perhaps a spike and, um, you know, or a seasonal fluctuation, but I don't, I don't think that's the case here. And I, I don't know as if he, he has actually retracted or, or rethought um, those comments that uh, were made previously. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that and um, just we'll perhaps take a break maybe. Okay, Emma. So I would say we were really encouraged by the agency's presentation this morning and we are at the ready to work on any solutions that the state has proposed and also work on the solutions that we brought forward in our memorandum. Um, and that we are ready to collect data and use data to measure whether the initiatives that the state wants to implement are being successful. And I think the addition of, of some sort of timeline or time period, you know, so that we can measure and assess whether we've achieved this in, you know, a year from now or at the end of the summer is also something we should add. But um, we need to look at them in more detail, but we were encouraged by what we saw this morning. So one thought I have, and I'll just throw it out here, uh, and then it's part of what I was perhaps going to say tomorrow afternoon, if we get when we get to it, is that I would like to ask, uh, I, I would like to not have us necessarily be in the position of evaluating which are the best proposals or not the best proposals. I don't think that's our job, particularly as the legislature, except unless there's a major initiative that requires significant funding or authorization, et cetera. But I, I would like to ask uh, the department and the hospital association as two of the major stakeholders to take their suggestions and put them into actionable um, time measures time, time measures and, and metrics to measure the successful implementation of those which are deemed uh, you know, as immediate and, and some of the, the medium term goals. I think that, I think to ask the department and the hospital association to come back and say, great, some great ideas here, Let's let's put let's put them into a time frame and uh, some metrics to measure whether we whether we've gotten there. And I think that would take us uh, and that with a longer, with a with a broader what I would call a an aspirational goal, but an actually achievable goal of no child waiting in an emergency room for mental health services uh, would be uh, would give us something to 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 look to collectively and measure ourselves against. Not me not criticize each other, but measure ourselves. What did we do? What, what has been successful in moving this forward? And in fact, uh, over time, that uh, trend line, uh, if it gets to where we hope it will be, how do we keep it there? Uh, so that, that's the kind of thing, and that, that's not gonna happen by tomorrow. I don't expect it to happen by tomorrow, but that's, that's kind of one of the things I would hope to, that we might, that might come out of our testimony. Representative Houghton. Thank you, I am encouraged by all the meetings we've had on this and the path forward, I guess I just want to say that, um, and I'm I'm confused a bit by the numbers that we've heard in both presentations, but if I'm remembering correctly, we may have one or two children still waiting in an emergency room department for potentially seven or more days right now. And I think we need to find a way to help those children so quickly. Um, so I'm just, you know, I just got, I, I just have to bring it back to that, although I'm thrilled about this path forward we have. Thank you. Thank you. And I feel like I, you know, I, I've been trying to bring this to closure and I keep opening it up, but I, I feel like I need to add one, one more issue to the table that has actually been in the back of my mind for every time we've talked about children and uh, waiting in emergency departments, especially when we hear Jack McCullough say that part of why some children wait is because they're deemed a danger to themselves or others. We, we, need to, we need to require ourselves to look at the painful, really painful data of the children who were a danger to themselves. 
in who we lost. And that's and that and this is not attributing any kind of uh, anything other than the fact that well where we collectively have not been successful in finding a way to help those children and their families in a very difficult time that's led to a death, um, and so I think that that's a that's a very hard thing to look at and a very painful thing to talk about, but I think that that has to be part of the picture that we look at as well. Uh, so I, and I know that and I know that there's a lot of resource being mobilized by the department and others. Uh, and it's a very, very important issue. Uh, but I, I just add it to the to the table of things if we're if we're thinking about what's happening with children and mental health and or uh, the challenges that children and young people face. It has to be part of the conversation as well. So and we need the data around that as well. Uh, Representative Donahue. I, I just uh, can't help but then add in as we try to wind up that that part of that balance and consideration has to be that, you know, death that results is often from the sense of terrible hopelessness. And if when you've tried to get help, you wait for days in an emergency room, um, that contributes rather than yeah. helping prevent. It can be a trauma that um, right. makes it um, higher risk for you rather than saying, well, we're keeping you safe. You are for that, those eight days, um, but then uh, maybe things are worse afterwards. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I think that's part of why it's been in the back of my mind as we're talking about this, that we, we want to find ways to uh, mitigate additional trauma in an already difficult situation for a young person. Okay, Representative Goldman. I can't help be struck by you bringing up the issue of, of children who do harm to themselves. We had a tragedy in our community this weekend, this past weekend, of a, it was an auto accident involving alcohol um, and a 16 year old died. Um, and you know, to me, that's a child that's hurting. So how do we sort of identify them as well? I, you know, we're focusing on the ER and that's in a really important place but I think we have to also broaden a little bit and think about other children who are hurting. So I yeah. just want to throw that out there. Well, and, and I, I want to just say that I think that I will give credit to the commissioner of mental health this morning in bringing into the conversation, the commissioner of DCF uh, and the commissioner of Dale as well, or the folks from Dale, um, uh, because there are definitely young people who are not in the ER uh, but who are whose lives are so disrupted that they are in the care and custody of the state uh, and clearly are in need of tremendous, uh, tremendous support. Okay, I think I'm not going to take a break right now. I think I'm going to suggest that we bring this to close or close for the afternoon. We will find a way to reschedule uh, what uh, we were going to do earlier. I know I'm not going to try to do it now. Uh, and we'll, we'll, We'll work our way through this, and I think I think I want to just say that I think this is an important piece of work of this committee right now, and uh, it's not just measured by what bill we pass or what bill we didn't pass or what's going forth back between us and the Senate right now. I think this is an important piece of our work collectively as a as a healthcare committee. So let's stop for. I'm going to suggest we stop for the afternoon. We're back here tomorrow morning uh, as a committee uh, when, in fact, interestingly enough, we're going to uh, we're going to be looking at several several sections of the budget and then we're going to be hearing from a number of advocates uh, late in the morning as well around some of the work that uh, is still ongoing. And we will then in the afternoon, of, of, given um, hoping the floor will allow it, we'll come back to a some further discussion around uh, this issue tomorrow afternoon. But in the meantime, we'll reflect on what we've heard today uh, from each other and as well as from our witnesses.